Hello and welcome to my AI salon where we discuss all manner of things relevant to artificial intelligence. Today's topic is the relationship between clustering and classification in natural language processing or NLP. I'm Dr. AJ, Aliana J. Marin. You're here doing AI with Dr. AJ. So suppose that we have a corpus and I'm going to imagine for our, our sake something very simple because I'm going to devise a few uh, slides to go along with this and you'll see them inserted in, in a little bit. And just for ease and visualization and ease in our thinking, let's say we have only 20 documents. I know, ridiculously simple. And suppose that you run all the necessary and ordinary preliminary algorithms and you wind up with what I'm going to call a reference term vector, a term vector where you define the various terms that you're going to use for your k-means clustering algorithm. And suppose that, just again, to make things very easy, you wind up limiting your vector to 100 terms. That means that there's 100 terms throughout your corpus of here, just 20 items. And each term is, res is uh, reflected by a vector field. So the strength, the value of that vector field reflects how much that term is being used in a specific document. So for 20 documents, we have 20 vectors. K-means is a very simple clustering algorithm. It's linear. That is, you're going to take the vector for one document and take the vector for the other document, and you'll compare the terms, dot, 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 going down the line, and the strength of that value, the cosine similarity, reflects how similar not so much the documents are, but the extent to which the terms are being used in the same frequency in both documents. And just as a side note, there are mechanisms by which you can make those terms be a little bit more comprehensive. We call this making equivalence classes. So terms that mean exactly the same thing, you combine, you roll them up, and have them represented by one term. That's set. Let's move on. Okay. Suppose you run your k-means, and you establish your initial value for k, your number of clusters, and suppose you say that you want it to be three, and you run the algorithm and you get three clusters, and you examine those clusters, which you can do manually because you have a very small corpus, and you have a, a vector for each of those documents, you only have 20 vectors, it's very easy to do this. So you're looking at your documents, and you're saying, you know, document three here, I really, you know, it's, it's in cluster A, but I really think it should be in cluster C. And so you're feeling a little, mm, that wasn't so good. And then you go on down a little bit and you say, hmm, here it is, document 16. It's in cluster B, and I wish that it was in cluster A. And you go on and you find a list of things that you would like to fix. So you go ahead and do your fixing steps. We call this feature engineering. Okay, you finesse all sorts of things, which we will not bother discussing right now. And you keep running the algorithm. And you get successively better and better results. One of the things that you may change is the value for k. You may say, you know what? I'm squishing these things together and, and it just isn't working out. I really want to split them apart. So I'm going to have, instead of three clusters, maybe four, maybe five. Whatever it is that you need to do so that your clustering matches your mental ontology. Ontology being your mind map for the content, the symbolic content of your corpus. Now, after you've done that to your heart's content, meaning you've just plain run out of patience, and, you know, the law of diminishing returns has definitely kicked in, and you were so over it, so, you know, you're saying, done is done. And, you know, there might be one or two left that you just really wish that something was in a different cluster, but you're willing to live with the results because, as we said, you run out of patience. What you can do then is treat your clustering as very good EDA, exploratory data analysis. You can present that to management and say, look, out of our corpus, and presumably you'd have a much larger corpus for this, but out of our corpus, uh, we have these different clusters. These are what people are talking about. And this is very good. It gives, it gives you that insight. It tells you which topics are dominant, which topics are sort of oddball. You might get like a, a little side cluster of just a couple of documents. Gives you a sense of the 
terms that dominantly characterize each cluster. It's all very useful, but in practical application after that EDA, you may want to classify. So for that, your clustering becomes a really good mechanism for assigning classes to different documents. So if you wound up being comfortable in this little example with five clusters, you might then say, I want five classes. And you would assign the document for supervised training here, which is the simplest, easiest way to go about it. You would assign the document a classification based on the cluster to which it got assigned. Now, two things that can happen here. First, you have a chance to finesse things. Because remember, we were sort of saying, oh, you know, this document was over here, but I really wish it was there. Well, you could, at your will, reassign it to a different cluster. The algorithm didn't put it there, okay? You were coming in, we're talking like deus ex machina, the hand of the god, you being god here, and arbitrarily moving it to where you want it to be. Second thing, if you're doing a modestly sophisticated, not terribly fancy, let's just say a really, really basic multi-layer perceptron, single hidden layer, you're not trying to get rip-roaring with deep learning architectures, something very basic. Even at a basic level, a neural network will give you feature combinations that are based on combinations and relative strengths of input values, where your inputs here are the 100 different vector fields. So two or three or more can combine to be very indicative of a certain feature that helps classification. Whereas back in clustering, it was very linear. You know, are two values similar to each other? Good, then we get a little strength. So it gives you a chance when you're doing supervised training to install a little bit more subtlety, a little bit more sensitivity to nuance than you would have had just with straightforward clustering. So, in short, clustering is good to experiment with, to explore, to characterize your initial data. You can find out what terms are important. You can get a pretty good ballpark on what the innate structure or nature of your data is. It also is a setup for this second stage, which would be classification, where it al allows you to give preliminary labels to the documents in your corpus, and then, based on your interpretation of clustering results, you can finesse that and take it further. Thank you, my friends. We'll see you next time.